Welcome back to the CSP Elite Baseball Development Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Cressy, and this is episode 187. We've got an awesome guest today. He's a guy who's got over four decades of experience in the strength and conditioning field across the college, professional, and private sectors. And not only a, a lot of great results as a coach himself, but he also has a proven track record of developing some great coaches. If you look to any professional sport all across the private sector, you're gonna see his fingerprints all over some outstanding coaches and, and playing a really active role in their development. And so we're going to talk about everything from developing coaches to managing athletes in season. And really what was of particular interest to me in this conversation is he has, uh, you know, children, a son and a daughter who have both been outstanding athletes that have been successful and kind of grew up in gyms. So I, I listened as a dad as much as I did as a strength conditioning coach um, just to pick up on some tidbits that I think will help with our daughters. So I think this is a really good one across the multiple fronts. Hopefully you enjoy it. This episode is brought to you by AG1, the most comprehensive NSF certified for sport daily nutritional supplement I've ever tried. With so many stressors in life, it can be difficult to maintain effective nutritional habits and give our bodies the nutrients they need to thrive. As a father of three young kids and a co-founder of multiple businesses in multiple states on top of still being an avid exerciser, I know that busy schedules can really take their toll on us. Whether it's poor sleep, exercise or life stressors, environmental factors, or simply not eating enough of the right foods, we can often wind up deficient nutritionally. This is where AG1 can really help. It's a game-changing nutritional insurance policy. They simplify the logistics of getting optimal nutrition on a daily basis by giving you just one thing with all the best things. That's why I use it daily, as do several of my family members, and we recommend it to a lot of our top athletes. One scoop of AG1 contains 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients that work together to fill the nutritional gaps in your diet to support energy, focus, digestion, and recovery. And this can all happen for less than $3 per day and without taking multiple products. While most nutritional supplements come to market and stay stagnant, AG1 continues to obsessively improve this one holistic formula based on the latest research, producing over 50 improvements in the last decade alone. They invest in the most absorbable and natural source of each ingredient and go above and beyond in third-party testing to ensure their customers continue to receive the highest quality and best tasting nutrition habit on the planet. Whether you're keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free, it'll work for you, and it contains less than one gram of sugar per serving. They put 75 ingredients through the rigorous NSF certification test to come up with a safe formula that's trusted by some of the world's top athletes, including many of our own at Cressy Sports Performance. Right now, AG1 is giving our listeners a special offer of 10 free travel packets with their first purchase. Just head to drinkag1.com backslash Cressy and claim this special offer. These travel packets are perfect for supporting your immune system, energy, and gut health while you're traveling for games, training, or simply on the go. They can be great counterbalance to the less than ideal on the road food options that are out there for a lot of our traveling baseball players. So if you want to bridge the gap between deficient and optimal and give yourself the best chance of getting nutrient diversity, head to drinkag1.com backslash Cressy to get 10 free travel packets with your first purchase. Again, that's drinkag1.com backslash Cressy, C-R-E-S-S-E-Y. You won't regret it. Today's guest has a strength and conditioning career that spanned more than four decades across the private sector, college realm, and professional settings. His career in strength and conditioning began at Boston University, where he served as head strength and conditioning coach for 15 years and 25 years as the strength and conditioning coach for men's ice hockey. From 1991 to 1999, he served as the strength and conditioning coach for the Boston Bruins of the NHL, and in 2012, he joined the Boston Red Sox strength and conditioning staff for a two-year stint that included a 2013 World Series championship. In 1996, he co-founded Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning, one of the industry's first private strength and conditioning facilities. He was also the strength and conditioning coach for the 1998 U.S. Women's Olympic Ice Hockey Team that won gold in Nagano, as well as the 2014 silver medalist team in Sochi. He's also served as a consultant in the development of the USA Hockey National Team Development Program in Michigan. He's been a featured speaker at numerous strength and conditioning and athletic training clinics across the world and has produced dozens of instructional videos and multiple books in the area of strength and conditioning. Please welcome to the show, Mike O'Boyle. Mike, thanks so much for taking the time for a a long overdue appearance on this podcast. I'm excited to chat with you. I'm excited too. I've listened to a whole bunch, so it's nice to, it's nice to be a guest. All right. Well, so I'm going to, I'm going to start off with some self-deprecating humor. I, I have to be very careful asking this question, but we've joked that you got your first 
job in strength and conditioning the year I was born. That was 1981. Um, I'm, I'm probably balder than you, but this question is not intended to make you feel old, but rather to maybe give some context to our listeners for why you're in a position to answer this question is talk to me about how strength and conditioning has evolved over those 40 plus years and, and, you know, what's changed for the good and the bad and, and where do you think it's headed? Well, one, I mean, the biggest thing, and I've said this to a bunch of people, this is what people forget is that when I started doing this, they, the personal computer and the cell phone hadn't been invented yet. So we were legitimately pencil and paper people. We, the football secretaries were typing up rosters for testing that we were going to then write test scores on. Mm -hmm. So when you think about now, you know, iPads and athlete management software and all this stuff, I mean, we had no, I can remember there are people who will hear this and I, we were mimeographing sheets and some people will be like, mimeograph, like your parents were educated. So you probably, <laughs> maybe when you were a little saw or mimeo mimeograph and smelled it, but a lot of people don't even know. I mean, I can remember asking, Hey, can we get a computer? I can remember being shown the internet by one of my clients. I can remember my, one of my clients coming in when I had a computer and saying, this is going to blow your mind. I'm going to show you this. I'm going to connect you to this, like literally like, and I think he called it World Wide web, like, and you know, you're going to be able to put your stuff up on it. So just think about the field, mm -hmm. then flip it over and realize that in some days we've made no progress because we still have freaking people teaching powerlifting and teaching bodybuilding. So I can look at 1981 and say, there are some people still partying like it's 1981 <laughs> in terms of <laughs> the quality of programming that they're doing yet they may have a cell phone and a computer and an iPad and lots of other things. So I think, but at the same time, if you look at, I always give, I give Mark Verstegen credit for kind of pushing us into another era when he started talking about athletes performance and performance enhancement specialists. And that probably early two thousands was when things really started to change at a really, really rapid rate. And for you, that was right about the time you were getting in because you were 21 years old, 20 years old at that time. And and Mark, I think, was, was a real... I started talking, I, I tweeted about change makers today. Mm -hmm. So Berardi gets a, gets yeah. a plug on this Great podcast book. inadvertently. Mm -hmm. But I think Mark was a big change maker for me. I remember going to watch Mark work. I went to Bradenton to visit. Uh, Mike Potenza actually had interned yeah. at IPI. And I had a bunch of these kids coming back and talking to me about IPI, IPI this, IPI that. You should do it. They're doing an IPI. And then another one of my friends, this guy, Matt Fisher, brought me a magazine, outside magazine, that had an article on Mark. And it was Mark and Daryl Leto. I don't know if you've ever met yeah. Daryl, but Absolutely. I love Daryl. Yeah. He's a great strength coach in his own right. But Daryl was in all the pictures. And I kind of knew Daryl from when he was at Arizona State. Mm -hmm. So I just got a hold of Daryl and said, hey, we want to come down and watch and see what you guys are doing. But I mean, Mark had a med ball wall. Nobody, everybody else was just chucking med balls around and chasing them. And there was a med ball wall. And I, but I remember like, these are the things you look at and go, med ball wall. That's freaking brilliant. We need a med ball wall. And it was, and he was, he was the first one. I think Daryl actually introduced me to Gray Cook mm -hmm. and started talking about FMS. And Gray was talking about diagonal patterns and kind of how like not in Voss and some of these, pro, you know, PNF patterns applied to strength and conditioning. And it was, it was a really cool time. It was just, it was very rapid, but I still think we've got people now and it's 2024 20, or whatever. And some people still haven't embraced any of that stuff. Yeah. I love people say the functional movement screen is stupid. And I think that just shows me how dumb you really are because <laughs> it was groundbreaking. Yes. Maybe you might have different thoughts about it, but it's certainly not stupid. And it certainly was something that, that you know, given its time and its kind of place in the history of the field, it really changed the way a lot of people thought. It's the same way, like I have people all the time. I love the guys. I disagree with with McGill about core training, and I'm like, do you really? Like, how many exactly, studies have you published? How many, how many studies have you published? Exactly. Like I look at these people, think, like, just give me a rough estimate of the number because I'm pretty sure it's zero. <laughs> you know, and how many of his books have you actually read cover to cover? And yeah. then have you ever spoken to him? Yeah. And the answer to all of those things would be no. And so I, I think it's that's the interesting part to me is that it's it's been, I guess, very wave-like in terms of there was some really big changes and there was some people that really embraced and rode the wave. And then there's some other people that have just been flat in the water for a really long yeah. time. <laughs> yeah, you're right, though. The, like the, the early 2000s like was transformative for me because 
I was like a, I was a high motivation guy and I was just craving information wherever I could find it. It was kind of the start of it. I think I wrote my first email in 1999 when I got to college. Like, so it was probably, you know, four or five years after that, where if you actually wanted to find information, it was out there. I can remember, you know, hitting refresh on tmag.com every Friday afternoon at three o'clock, like waiting for something from, you know, Berardi or Ian King or something like that. I think that the, the pendulum probably went in the opposite direction, right? Is there was almost too much information and, too few people who had really good filters. So it, it got watered down and maybe that's where we're at now. Yes. And then and it also, it got privatized, you know, people like, like we did, people went out and started opening up their own places. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of really, this so much really good stuff has happened, but what really hasn't happened is enough people haven't really embraced a change and really embraced the knowledge process and said, okay, I really want to learn we have way too many. I have a picture in one of my presentations of a parrot. And there's just way too many people that are, that are parrots. Mm -hmm. They just want to keep repeating. I have people say to me, oh, you know, well, Louis Simmons says, or, or you know, they super training. And I'm like, like, okay, come on. I get it. I realize again, yeah. you know, at the time, really significant works. But there's a lot of stuff has gone on mm -hmm. since. And then I'll talk to people about West Side. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I did West Side in the 70s. And we were getting it from the original West Side guys. People don't even know that West Side was in California and that Louis Simmons didn't invest, invent West Side. He he literally, you know, whatever, I, I don't I would say co-opted the name of West Side Barbell Club. But West Side Barbell Club was in Southern California and it was George Friend and Roger Estep. And these are the guys that really invented box squats. And, and you know, people start arguing with me and I'm thinking, one of the things that I really get angry about, I think, is that people... I started doing a presentation. I think when I do functional strength coach eight, a big part of it's going to be on history. Cause I said, those who don't know history are destined to repeat it. And that's what we do. We find ourselves, people keep repeating the same errors over and over again. And then what happens? I did a podcast with a guy the other day who said he's uh, you know, he's another one of these charter members of the, I used to think Mike Boyle was a club. Cause he was like, <laughs> when I first started reading your stuff, I had thought about how stupid it was. Mm -hmm. And then I got hurt a little bit and I hurt some people. And then I started thinking, oh, maybe this guy's not crazy. Yeah. And, and that's the thing that I think of with a lot of people is that everybody, every young person that listens to this podcast should think about, okay, think about, read about the Dunning-Kruger effect and ask, okay, look in the mirror and say, am I really, am I the 25, 26, 27 year old who's strong and good in the weight room and thinks he knows everything? Or am I really studying and do i know my history do i mm -hmm. get if i'm talking about because again mark Verstegen now that you know athlete performance exos that was that's been 25 years it's yeah. been a long time for people and then you think you know what came before that and who came before that and there's just so much information as you said that you get some people who think that if it wasn't yesterday or two days ago that it, that it doesn't have merit so yeah I think, you know, when, when your clients walk into your, your facility, right, and there's something new, right? If, you, if you're a facility that started last year and they walk in and it's 90% different on Monday after you went to a seminar that weekend, that's a really bad sign, right? But when people walk into your place and they find a new exercise or something that's coached a little bit different or the, the, the programming structure is a little bit more adjusted, it's it's a tinker, not an overhaul. I, I think you earn the right to to publicly say, Hey, I was wrong about something. I can change my mind. And I give you a lot of credit over the years. You've been a guy who's never been afraid to change your mind and, you know, and, and almost, uh, you know, present on it and make actual content out of it because it's, it's important for others to learn that as well. What are some things that, you know, maybe you did five years ago that you're now questioning, refining, or something you've adjusted in the, in the past few years? Well, I think the biggest thing five years ago was that we weren't timing sprints. I look at that now and think, and again, I did, like I said, I did a whole presentation on it and talking about how the fact Steve Bunker for the longest time was talking to me about Chris Corfist and about Tony Holler. And we really should be running fly tens. And truthfully, sometimes I can be a little bit stuck in my ways, just like everybody. And I was kind of like, ah, it's a pain in the ass. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of expense. It's a lot of this. People are going to pull hamstrings. I had, I had the same excuses that everybody had. And then I thought I listened to Tony speak and Tony obviously was far more persuasive than Steve because he had my attention for an hour <laughs> and I'd read his articles yeah. and same way he was doing, I don't even know who he was writing for at that time, but he was writing a lot of stuff, maybe simply faster, but he was very prolifically putting out 
kind of pro speed stuff. And I started thinking about it and thinking, wow, I, I think he's got some valid points here. And that's the, what is big with me. When I think someone has valid points, mm -hmm. then I'm going to continue to pursue and say, okay, I, they got a valid point. Is this going to fit in our setup? Is it going to fit in our yeah. system? Is it? And the way our gym is set up, we could run fly tens. We yeah. can get a, a 25 so we can get a 15 yard fly in to do a fly 10. And now I would look at that and think if someone said, you know, the old, well, you can only do one exercise. I'd be like, I'd probably do, I'll probably do fly 10. I probably wouldn't even touch a weight. I'd probably just be sprinting and yeah. getting, getting literally the highest velocity muscle contraction that I could possibly elicit which is going to be that max speed or close or max velocity or close to max velocity. But the flip side of that is I, I don't even know if you know the name, this kid Hunter Eisenhower just wrote an article on uh, for simply faster on force. Okay. And I realized I'm like, okay, I don't even really understand physics anymore. And that's a little bit embarrassing, but I was, I have no problem saying it. I, I took physics 45 years ago at Springfield college. And I got a good grade in physics. And I'll be honest, I haven't. I started reading Dan Cleaver's Force, and it was just kind of too deep and not applicable. Mm -hmm. Hunter's article suddenly got me thinking, wow, wait, because I, I did a presentation for our staff yesterday, and I said, we are force managers. That's really what our job is. When you look at that weight, the, the weight idea is too simple because what you're really looking at is force mm -hmm. and how do we manage forces and when we don't manage forces well, people get hurt. So you think about whether they're pitching, jumping, whatever. If you don't manage those forces, you've got these high force output capability people. And then what's your job? Well, my job, whether pitching coach, whatever it is, I got to manage forces. I've got to make yeah. sure that this person doesn't basically rip his own arm off yeah. because, you know, not that the arm, it's not like Monty Python where the arm gets chopped <laughs> off and hits the ground, but it, you know, it gets like yeah. suddenly that arm becomes unusable. And you think you'd almost look at that and say, how can somebody be so gifted mm -hmm. that they have the ability to damage themselves? But that's sprinters, hamstrings, right? Yeah. It's pitchers, shoulders. And so, you know, starting to study, you know, I literally have gone back now into Cleaver's book and it's making me think more about, okay, maybe I have to think about velocity-based training. Yeah. Maybe I have to think about depth jumping, things that I don't necessarily like that I haven't really implemented. Mm -hmm. We're talking about making some, like you talked about, some significant changes in our programming going into the summer as we think about the concept of force mm -hmm. versus maybe the concept of strength or the concept mm -hmm. of power. And so I was the last couple of weeks I've been really excited because I love that I can find something at 64 that makes me think, hmm, this might really be a way that we can positively impact what we're doing. Cause I look at it and think we could sit back. We're doing a pretty good job. We've got good clients. Everything's going great. But much like you are, I'm never happy with that. I never look and think, oh, that's okay. You know, we're there. I never think like I never feel there. That's just not my personality. I think so often too, and this is something I probably dug in on more on force plates is, you know, you think it's going to be a purely objective measure. And you're like, all right, there's the jump momentum and there's the peak velocity. And then you go look at two guys who are matched for those characteristics and their force curves are entirely different, you know, like they're just spread out there. You realize that they're accomplishing a task by a wildly different mechanism. And, you know, there's probably a rationale from an exercise selection standpoint, a tempo standpoint. Um, it just opens up world of possibilities, but I'm, I'm curious because I've wrestled with this as well as um, I'm sure you're similar to me. I, I can't stand phones in the weight room, like huge distraction. You know, it's a big push to get everything on an app and all this stuff. And the problem is you open up an app and all of a sudden there's also Snapchat, there's Instagram, there's Twitter, there's all those other distractions, text messages coming in. Was that one of the initial reluctances behind? I mean, obviously with, with you know, timing gates and things like that, yeah, it's a little that, bit different. That and cost. One, I've been like you, I've been incredibly resistant to phones in the weight room. I do not, again, young people do not need more time spent with their phones. Yeah. Whenever anybody says there's an app, I'm like, great, <laughs> hang on to it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like I have no yeah. interest in apps. I have no interest in anything that is phone based in the weight room. Yeah. So I'm like hundred percent with you on yeah. that one. And, but now I'm looking and thinking, is there a way? So I got a couple of uh, Vitriv units, which, yeah. which I liked yeah. and you know, they're iPad based, but the cost now I start looking and thinking, okay, like for us, we've got 
pretty much 14 racks, eight in one facility, six in another. So if I decide to move to this technology, I have to buy at least 14 iPads with mounts. That's the yeah. minimum investment. And like for you or I, that's yeah. our investment. It's not yeah. the school. You're not looking, you're not yeah. going to the IT and saying, I need 14 iPads. And he's mm -hmm. saying, hey, order them up and slap them on there. You're thinking, hey, that's 14 grand or, you know, eight grand mm -hmm. or whatever that's coming off the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And so initially with, with VBT, you know, tendos were a thousand dollars a piece. Yeah. And I'm thinking, do I need, yeah. you know, do I need to plunk $14,000 into yeah. tendos? So uh, there was some of that. The good thing is the prices are coming down fast. Definitely. The products are improving really fast. We got one from a company called True Rep. That's a little magnet. I mean, it's this yeah. big that sticks on. And so I think that's making me come around. Also, the thing that that bothered me with some of the VBT stuff was people put it out half baked. It wasn't good. And then they brought it to you. So we had, um, Oh my God. What like bar sensei. And there was another one that mounted to the bar. I can't think of the name of it right now. I just was looking at it. I still have it sitting in my office, but in either case, they didn't work. So we had one day we had a staff meeting and we, we couldn't get it to pair. And it's like, come on guys, you can't, you can't put a product to market. We had, and I, I should, because Perch has come a long way, but we had to Perch people in a very, because we're obviously, like you were previously, we're in Boston, we're near MIT. Yeah. Yeah. So you get kids bringing you stuff all the time. Yeah. And Perch came out and they're showing us the camera-based system. And I said, okay, let's somebody do a clean and then we'll do it. And they said, oh, we, we can't analyze movement that fast. And I was like, okay, why are we doing, you're, you're, this is a velocity-based training system. Back to the lab. <laughs> yeah, and you can't, analyze rapid movement so that really is not going to help us yet and obviously it was a very early prototype for them but i was kind of just discouraged i was like jesus don't stop, don't keep bringing me stuff that and the people don't know how to sell it same thing with force plate yeah force plate people don't know how to sell force plates because you're i can i say to them all the time you're trying to sell a smart product to not necessarily real smart people. Right? <laughs> and I hate to say that about strength coaches in general, but I always say the, 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 uh, the chances of the atom being split in the average weight room is probably not very good. And so being able to bring somebody in who can really talk strength coach with somebody, because I looked at them and I said, okay, don't, you know, they like, look at this, look at this, look at this. Curve, look at I'm like, I don't look at anything. I want you to tell me what I'm looking for. Well, we can't tell you, you know, cause it could be this, it could, I'm the, then it's not any good. Yeah. If you can't give me, that's why like in Cleaver's book, you know, in, in book, Cleaver's book force, one of the things that he said is what you really want to focus on is impulse, focus on area under the curve. He said in peak velocity is a really good pro, uh, proxy for impulse. And I said, okay, that's the kind of information that I yeah. need. I need someone to say, all right, watch this thing. And then, Peak velocity is going to give you a lot of information. The guys, you know, it's kind of like, it's like with the old vertical. Yeah, the guy with the highest vertical jump usually had a lot of good stuff going on. Generally yeah. speaking, you, you didn't yeah. find too many guys who had the highest vertical who didn't run fast or throw far or shoot yeah. hard, or do whatever they were supposed to do. And that's where people have to be able to like, mm, can I narrow this down to a really yeah. simple metric that makes it easy for you to implement this into your process, which is what you want to, eventually that's what you want to do. I, I love that. And I, you know, I just think in general, um, I think it also is a, is a discussion of like what impacts the training process, right? Like what's a distraction? You know, what I, what you never want is like an athlete who's supposed to be taking two minutes between sets, taking four because the Wi-Fi is not working or he's arguing with an iPad or he's, he's trying to work through some of that. So um, and we've also seen scenarios where some of the velocity based training, like, we both know that athletes try to move too fast, try to compete with it. Sometimes the technique can go down the tubes as well. So you really have to, you have to realize there's a cost to just about everything. So not, and not just fiscal, but also just the quality of work. Um, yeah. And that's exactly, that is exactly what happened with us is that, you know, I used to say to people, there's exercise that is supposed to be done slow <laughs> and there's a reason for it. Yeah. Um, you're a progressive mind. You're always looking for ways to do things better. Um, I'm curious, maybe, maybe it builds on this previous you know, question, but what's something that's really intriguing you now as the next frontier? What's the thing you're thinking about at 3 a.m. as you stare off in the black? It, it really, it's the force thing, truthfully. Yeah. It is, it's having a better understanding of physics mm -hmm. so that I can look at, so as a, for instance, I, 
and and you realize you're not a fan of certain things because of the way they've been implemented. So I'm not a depth drop fan, mm -hmm. much in the same way I'm not a box jump fan. When you watch how bastardized high high box jumps were, and you watch like I think it was Trout or one of the that was they had that video of him like going up on like 68 inch mm -hmm. box, you know they got Reebok steps piled on top of each other, and you think this is really stupid. The guy makes like a hundred million dollars a year, and somebody's you know doing stupid pet tricks with him in the gym. It's like dumb, but then you realize, okay, that box jump is not inherently bad. High box jumping, inherently bad. I felt that way about depth jumping. We never depth jump. We never depth drop. We never did any rebounds. We were always over an obstacle. But now I start looking at this kind of, not, I won't even say force research, but somebody looking at, at those exercises from a different perspective. And I start saying, hmm, I think we do need to incorporate those and we need to figure out how to incorporate those. And more specifically, are we just dropping? Are we re-jumping? How are we going to specifically do that? The other piece, isometrics the same way. I think there's yeah. been a ton of, I was just listening to Alex Natera and uh, Danny Lum and another guy on the Pacey podcast talking about isometrics. And Alex is really, really smart. And I'm trying to figure out, like I started thinking, I just actually messaged him today about maybe trying to figure out he's talking about a strain gauge that he has because again, isometrics, great idea. Yeah. But in my place, what I'm worried about is our guys, are, I, am I eventually going to rip my racks out of the floor? Because yeah. that's the stuff yeah. I have to worry about. It, yeah. Like you, you don't, it's, everything's easy when it's not your money and when it's really yeah. not your facility and it's just some college and you think, okay, we tore all the racks out of the ground and someone else has to come in and screw them all back down again. Mm -hmm. In our situation, when that rack moves, it's a, a problem on a bunch of levels because there's a chance somebody got hurt. There, yeah. There's a lot of other things that yeah. went along with that besides the fact that we now have to shift all our racks six inches and try to figure out how to drill all new holes in the floor. <laughs> so it's not as simple as just get in the rack and push against it. And so those are the two big areas in my mind. We've been doing more isometric stuff the last couple of years, but but I would say we're dabbling. And I want to continue to dabble. And then we've got to be looking at depth drop. And it, I don't know if you read that Hunter's article, but it was, uh, I, I'm trying to think of uh, the title of it. It was something, in, if you looked at it simply faster, it was something relative to force. But he was talking about, and I used to do it with, I did it with the pitchers all the time, but it, it, was a, it was an empirical observation that we needed to lunge downhill because of the forces. I knew that, like I, I understood that pitchers, you know, that like mound versus flat ground, mound is much harder on your arm. Mm -hmm. So when we're training in the off season, we need, you know, we bought these big heavy wedges and we were able to kind of, you know, lunge down so that we were mimicking the, what we were going to get coming off the mound. But I never really kind of scientifically quantified that and thought mm -hmm. about how it was really affecting forces and then you get into that and look at that relative to acl prevention because mm -hmm. we talked about this yesterday too acl prevention really is just force management issue right you end up with somebody who's not managing their force as well and we see it you know young females they're gaining body weight i've, I've had this conversation with somebody and i said it's always the it, not always but it's very much post pubescent female yeah so um you know you got somebody who's going through puberty and your boys are gaining muscle mass. They're getting bigger. They're getting stronger. Yeah. Your girls are a lot of times just getting bigger. Yeah. They're gaining non-propulsive mass. The way the female body changes in puberty is not a sports performance adaptation, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's just yeah. not what's happening. So now you've got these young women who are unable to manage their forces because suddenly yeah. hey, my mass, my mass not only increased, but it redistributed itself. Like think about, like you think about yeah. that as a problem and say, okay, I've got this young female who suddenly, you know, her body changes and her distribution of her mass changes. And now I've got, you know, I'm trying to deal with rotational forces and landing. And it, it's not, I guess in some ways, not that surprising that it goes wrong. Yeah. So we, so I'm looking at it in that regard. Okay. Is it going to help us? Not, is it, I know it's going to help us from an ACL prevention standpoint, but then you know how my head works. I have to figure out how to make that progressive. I've got to look at that and say, okay, how do I make that progressive and programmable? So it's not just some idiot jumping off a 40 inch box. Yeah. 
And now I've got people with patella tendonitis or patella yeah. femoral problems or whatever, you know, so I've, you know, I've swapped problems with somebody. I'm going to jump around a little bit. I had some questions that were going to go in the baseball room, but I want to talk about youth sports just because you kind of touched it. What happens in the, in the teenage years. I think we probably both agree that the average call it 14 year old that walks into our facility today is probably exponentially worse um, from a global athletic development standpoint than they were say 10, 15 years ago. They've, they've actually devolved. Um, maybe it's early sports specialization, you know, it could be a host of other factors, just sedentary lifestyles and staring at phones. What do you think the biggest challenges we face are now with our, our young athletes? And do you think that there are actually solutions that are out there, you know, uh, that can be implemented to, to really change these trends that we're seeing from an injury standpoint? Well, one, you, you hit on two things. Yeah. I think we see more multi-sport kids. So I think we see less kids that are less athletic. So I don't see that because I have a lot of my experience has been like my son and his friends. Yeah. And a lot of these kids actually were really good multi-sport athletes. Most of them played two sports through high school and didn't have a lot of those problems. So I think you get into the early specialization multi-sport thing. So you say, what, that's the problem. The problem is a motivated but uneducated parent. That's literally the essence of our problem. We have somebody... And because we all want our kids to succeed, right? I wanted my kids to succeed. You want your girls to succeed. Whatever it is they're going to do, we'd like them to be good at that. The problem is that we, I always say, we apply an adult formula to a youth problem. And that generally results in failure. So for you, you and I want to be the best strength coaches in the world. We are going to study strength and conditioning. You're not going to sit around and say, I think I'm going to get a, a law degree so that I become a better strength coach. I'm going to spend a lot of time studying case law in a bunch of these different areas. Maybe I'll study tax law. You wouldn't do that, right? And nobody in the adult world does that. They specialize because they've decided they're going to be something. That's the exact wrong thing for a child. So when you're looking at, you know, if you looked, and I did this, and my kids have been, you know, more than moderately successful. I Both of them will have played in college. Both of them will have gotten money to go to college. They, they've done reasonably well, but we deliberately did not specialize. And it was a conscious decision. My daughter yeah. wanted to specialize. Yeah. She fought it tooth and nail. She wanted to be, you know, on the hockey training. She wanted to, to play in the summer tournaments and just play hockey. And I literally, I, I, I she probably thanks me now, but you know, I made her play soccer. I made her do a lot of things that she did not want to do. And I, people I have sometimes the Twitter verse will be like, you made her do it. I'm like, I made her. I absolutely made her. I made her go to soccer. <laughs> Every year, I made her go out. And I said, nope, you're going to be in the fall, you're playing soccer, whether you like it. In the spring, we played soccer because in yeah. town soccer, they have two seasons. She's yeah. playing both. And she was good at it. And I, But I knew, you know, she wasn't a soccer kid. She wasn't going to go and play high school soccer, but I made her do it. We made her swim. We, you know, we made her do a lot of things that people don't make their kids do. My son was kind of the opposite. He wanted to play multiple sports. Mm -hmm. We actually made him in a way, not made him, but kind of shoved him out of baseball and into lacrosse because I thought baseball is a really crowded area in our town. Tons of kids that want to be baseball players. Lacrosse is where kids like him, you know, I always say if you're a kid that can catch and hit in baseball and can shoot a hockey puck, you're probably going to be a good lacrosse player mm -hmm. because you, you've understand, you know, the spatial relationships are yeah. very, very similar. You've learned to catch, you know, with a glove extended over your head. Yeah. You've learned to, you know, to make objects move mm -hmm. with an extension of your arms, those kind of things. And that's what he ended up being best at. But he would have been a hockey player. Same way, I think, if you'd said to him, what do you want to do? He knew, you know, 14 years old, he was like, I'm better at lacrosse. Mm -hmm. I like hockey. Probably, you know, if you said, what do you like more? He goes, I like hockey more. But I know I'm better at lacrosse. So I think it, yeah. it's you're it's doing your kids the real service of understanding that not specializing actually is the way to be better. It goes back to the, you know, the, the idea of, you know, you want a big, you want a high pyramid, you build a big base. Yeah. I'm totally against that in the aerobic world and I'm totally for it in the <laughs> sports world. So you'll build that base of athleticism with your kid because there's a great book actually. Uh, oh my God. The old UVA coach, Dom Starzia, wrote a book called I Hope You Will Be Very Happy. 
Stories from a Lifetime of Lacrosse. It is the by one of the worst named books I think I've ever read, <laughs> and one of the better books that I've read in the last five years, because mm -hmm. it's just his stories about being at Brown and being at UVA. But one of the chapters is, can my kid play D1? Mm -hmm. And he had simple, he said, I tell parents all the time, is your kid the best athlete in your high school? Is he the best player on at least two teams? Mm -hmm. If the answer is no, he probably can't play D1. Yeah. And I was like, that's, <clears throat> we've made that not a reality now in some ways by specialization because we've pulled kids yeah. out of some other areas. But in general, if you left yeah. kids to their own devices, and you know, because you're in pro baseball now, right? Mm -hmm. When you talk to the American guy that played mm -hmm. professional baseball, more than likely he was a high school quarterback. Yep. More than likely, he was a real good basketball player. Even like Ortiz. Ortiz told me he was like, I would I would have been a basketball player if I had my choice. I loved basketball mm -hmm. in the DR. He yeah. said, but I knew the way out of the DR was not basketball. Yeah. That All these guys big. were the best athletes in the history of their town. There's a lot of late bloomers oh. in the big leagues who just, you know, got to college and made the choice of which one they were going to go into. Yeah. So, And I tell it. people that all the time. I, look, I remember talking to John Lackey about pitching, and he was like, I played quarterback, so I didn't pitch in high school. I didn't have time to pitch because I played quarterback. I didn't pick up pitching until junior college. I was like, you're pitching. And then I looked at DeGrom, same thing. Starts pitching in college and was a closer. And he didn't become a starter until yeah. he was like a senior. Yeah. And there's so many of these stories, and you think with the parents – why aren't you reading them? <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's amazing. How That's it, what well, frustrates me. Well, I think it's hard because they've got guys like us that are in one year talking about, hey, this is the path that we've seen over and over again, working in the, in the majority of people. But in their other year is someone who wants their money, you know, as part of a travel yeah. program or something like that. So they're inherently, it's the devil and the angel on, on each shoulder, right? Yeah. And it's, but it's amazing. But to me, it's just, I say to people all the time, I mean, people are saying, oh, well, you know, that the, those stories just because they were the best athletes. And I said, I don't believe I, you know, I understand you can argue chicken or egg, but I've been looking at this. I remember talking to Nomar Garcia Parra yeah. years ago and he walked on at Georgia tech as a kicker. <laughs> he said, I would have played pro soccer if pro soccer was a better option in the United States that, you know, cause he ended up marrying yeah. me a ham, yeah. huge soccer fan mm -hmm. grew up. Cause he, you know, I think parents are originally from Mexico grew up with soccer, but he realized, okay, I'm good at soccer. I can kick on the football team but where I'm most naturally gifted and where the best chance of me playing professionally is, is in baseball. And those stories, I have, I literally have a picture of Mia Hamm. She played um, Pop Warner football in Texas. Like one. legit played on the team. There's a, in, in one of her biographies, they talk about the fact that the boys talked her into coming out. They said she was the best runner out of all of us. She was the fastest player out of all of us. And so we talked her into, you know, we got her in pads and a helmet in like seventh grade or sixth grade or something like that. And she played I love that. football in Texas. And you think all of these like soccer people, all these baseball people, and you, it's the same. It goes back to what we talked about earlier. They don't know history. Yeah. And now they can find a kid and say, well, well, so-and-so specialized yeah. and he made it. I'm like, of course he did. Because eventually the best kids yeah, are going to make it. I mean, genetically speaking, you know, you look at, you know, Hazel Baker's kid's probably going to be a good baseball player, right? His, yeah. his shirt's up behind you. You know, these guys, <laughs> you look yeah. in the NHL, there's a there's a, just a massive number of kids. Shane Doan's kid just, you know, just played for Phoenix the other day. The, the genetic part can't be underplayed. Mm -hmm. But if you really want your kid to be good, mm -hmm. then develop a broad base of athleticism yeah. in them very, very early. Interesting one. Um uh, a well-known major league baseball player, I won't say who, gave me a, a, a tribute. He's a, a very big advocate for, hey, go to college, don't sign out of high school, whatever it is. He said, name a high school draft pick outside of the first two rounds. So in other words, somebody who got less than $1.5 million in the draft who worked out in professional baseball. In other words, you know, had a long career. It took me two years to come up with a name. And the, the reason <laughs> is simple. Those those high school draft picks now they they've built that narrow base. There's not that much upside unless they're like a surefire thing who's going to shoot through the minor leagues. It's it's very hard to find a ninth rounder out of high school who signed for three hundred thousand dollars that goes on to have an eleven year big league career. It's it was incredible. I actually I thought on this for years before I actually finally came up to one. So I think yeah, there's something to be said about building that base. Got to get Adam Grant or Epstein and somebody to write that book because because <laughs> you're right. I mean and. 
that is almost all. It's the same way I bet. If you look at Canadian junior players, you'd probably see the same thing. Uh, it's there's so much evidence running to the contrary of what the average lay person believes that it's staggering. Yeah. And yet, as you said, because of the money thing, because unfortunately there are so many people in whether it's AAU basketball or ODP soccer or whatever it is, there are so many people who are just willing to lie, like literally lie right to somebody's face. I was, I go back, Carl Crawford, full scholarship to UCLA to play basketball. Mm -hmm. Full scholarship to Nebraska to play football, or you know, at that time, a million dollars to go play baseball with Tampa Bay. Carl took the base. No, well, it's like, funny too. You talked about super training, like you, you read that book, and it's you know, a lot of it's based entirely on the fact that a lot of the athletes that were the foundation for a lot of that research were multi-sport Soviet kids who did a wide variety of things to build the foundation that allowed them to leverage a lot of those advanced principles so if we take all of those strategies and we throw them at a bunch of kids who have only played baseball their entire life the benefits of super training probably are a little bit more uh i guess attenuated you could say just a very different world um so let's talk about your own kids because i i think you did some really as you implied you did you did some really good things uh, not just good athletes but good people and i remember you saying in a presentation a while back that one of the smartest things you did with your own kids development was two lifts per week from age 11 on um talking about like was that something that you were doing in real time? Was it something you realized in hindsight? And what did it, you know, what did it mean for your kids? We interrupt this podcast with a quick reminder that this episode is brought to you by AG1. It's an NSF certified all-in-one superfood supplement that features 75 whole food sourced ingredients designed to support your body's nutritional needs. I use this product daily myself and a ton of our athletes do as well. Head to drinkag1.com backslash Cressy and claim my special offer of 10 free travel packets with your first purchase. AG1 gives you peace of mind that you're covering all your nutritional bases. Again, that's drinkag1.com backslash Cressy, C-R-E-S-S-E-Y, and you'll get that special offer. Well, I think one, what, what we both know is once you start, you can't stop. You just can't because we've both witnessed that for far too long where you get this kind of fitful commitment to the weight room where people show up in the off season and those people generally tend to not do well. And you see, yeah. like for us, I saw at the college level, if you got kids who you kind of held them captive for four years, you could make a massive difference in yeah. those kids. And so I started looking at that and thinking, Hey, I'm going to do that with my kids. I'm going to, I'm, we're going to stick to the idea that we're working out twice a week, really pretty much no matter what. And my kids yeah. would tell you that it was not easy to get me to the idea, oh, I don't want to lift today. Then, okay, we'll lift tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I don't want to lift tomorrow. Okay, we'll go Saturday morning. I, was, I it, just, was it always you or was it, you know, Kevin and Nicole and other coaches? Well, it was always somebody out? else generally coaching yeah. them Good. because yeah. I was always there, but I also realized that dad kind of needs to be dad and it's a lot easier to be dad when you're not trying to be coach at the same time mm -hmm. so i was present but whether it was uh, with my daughter it was brendan rearick actually in the beginning i remember saying to brendan you got the short scrub buddy you got her <laughs> and uh and with my son and his friends it was joe squiz always you know kind of ran I, i'm everybody's assistant but i'm nobody's uh i'm nobody's boss and i'm good at setting stuff up and it's sort of, I'll get the sheets ready and I'll do the thinking part and make up, you know, I'll write the weights out. I'll get everything yeah. done. But sometimes I'd say to Joe, yeah, you got to go over and bark at those guys a little bit to, mm -hmm. to get them to do what they need to do. But yeah, that idea, and Zach DeCant did a great job in that is moving over Max's book where he talked about that. It Again, right. What is it? It's math. Mm -hmm. My kids got 200 plus workouts in through high school. And there's a reason I post videos of my son all the time. My son can do, I think he's done a triple with 90 pounds in the chin up. And he's not, if you looked at him, you wouldn't say, oh, gifted lifter. It's natural for him. It's not at all. He's kind of a wiry, lanky kind of guy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but he's been in the weight room the whole time. And he, we yeah. just been chipping away. And you, when you do that, that's the other thing that you do that gives your kids a really significant advantage as they get older. My daughter, people would always say, your daughter shoots like a guy. Mm -hmm. My daughter shoots like a guy because she's strong. She's probably as strong as most of the kids on your high school team, right? <laughs> and she shot more pucks than your kids yeah. have. So the result is that she shoots like a guy. 
Mm-hmm. And that was always a you know a big advantage for her to play, to have a really heavy shot and to be, she was never tall, but she was always really dense and not very easy to move. Mm-hmm. And if you can shoot and you're dense and not easy to move, you tend to score goals. That's awesome. Um, She's a lot. So talk to me, I, obviously you've been both dad and coach. I think a lot of parents shy away from it. Maybe you answered this question by having some of your staff help out with it, but yours obviously worked. Were there key principles that you tried to adhere to in your interactions with your kids, either around the training aspect of it or the actual like post-game interactions and things like that? I'll be honest. I got better. I was, I was probably not as good with my daughter and my one thing, sons and daughters are different. And I think firstborn and secondborn are different. That's yeah. all like you, again, you're, you go through all that. And I was probably a little harder on my daughter, but my daughter was pretty well geared for it. Mm-hmm. It didn't bother her. Also, because she was at, you know, at younger ages, she was clearly better. Mm-hmm. So it was easy to be hard on her because she was having a lot of success. So I wasn't raining on her yeah. parade because yeah. everybody, you know, she was always better and always scoring and always experiencing a lot of success. She was always playing up and she played with boys yeah. when she was 11 or 11 year old year and, and played really well. And then for a 12 year old year, they let her play U14 because they, she, that was the level that she was at. So she was easier, but I was always hard. Like I was very honest with her about her performances. My son, it was different because he was a little bit of a late bloomer. And I, I had to be more, I think, more encouraging with him. I, I said this the other day. I think I pushed my daughter more and pulled my son more. So I think mm-hmm. you have to figure out you can't. Yeah. It's not the same in terms of. Some of them, you're just giving them a shove and get, you know, get your ass out there and do what you got to do. And other ones, you're kind of pulling along and saying, hey, you." I used to tell my son, Time, you're doing great. You're going to catch up to a lot of these kids. I, you know, I would always say to him, slow and steady wins the race. These kids aren't doing the work that you're doing. You're going to catch up to these kids. And by his senior year, he had. I mean, he was the, you know, the second line center on a really good high school hockey mm-hmm. team that went to the Final Four. He was, you know, the best midfielder on a team that won the state championship. But if he looked back at him at, 12 you would have said oh you know these four or five kids are maybe better than him Mm -hmm. in you know in both sports and so he was one that needed to be a little bit more encouraged but i also i i continued to study like i do and i've i learned to be able to say hey i really like to watch you play Mm -hmm. i i want them to know i get a like i'm getting a lot of joy out of this Mm -hmm. as a parent just being here it's like right now my son He's playing college lacrosse as a freshman and he plays, but not as much as he'd like to play Mm -hmm. because he's a freshman, but he's the only freshman really who's getting any playing time on offense. So he's, he's doing okay. Mm -hmm. And, but I think sometimes at the end of the game, he kind of looks and he's like, Oh, I didn't play that much. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I love watching you play. It's fun. I love the parents. I love the program. I'm not because it's really easy for kids to attach their worth to your opinion. Mm -hmm. And that's the part you have to be careful of. You can't look at it and think that, okay, I'm sort of reserving my love for you on days that you perform well. <laughs> and yeah. I think some parents do that. Yeah. And they inadvertently do that. I've seen parents, oh yeah, I pay them, you know, a dollar every goal or a dollar. Yeah. And I'm like, don't do shit like that. Like that's yeah. stuff bad. Yeah. What just about- go to the game, tell them you love them. Yeah. Tell them, and you should, I always think about it. You should tell your kids you love them every day, whether... Yeah. It has anything to do with sports, whether it has anything to do. I say good night. I text mm-hmm. my kids still now. Mm-hmm. I love you. Good night when I'm going to sleep. I do it yeah. almost every single night before I go to bed because I want them to know that I do love them and that it, their worth is not based on the fact that they're good athletes. Mm-hmm. The, their worth is based on the fact that they're my kids and that I love them. And if yeah. I would love them if they were whatever piano players or if they were. Right, but more if they're piano players now. <laughs> if you go to the you start to realize yeah. you should raise musicians. But well, I, uh, you know, it's it's hard because they don't come with with instruction booklets. Like we have twins, and they couldn't be more different. We have one that's like the rule follower, hanging on every word their coach says, and meanwhile, her sister's like kicking dandelions and staring at the field next to them, and she's more interested in the the fan that blows the mist on a hot day than she is in actually generating a sweat. So, um, but I, I am curious. You know, a son and a daughter, and one of the things I've always I've definitely seen with my daughters, I obviously don't have a son, but I hear about friends where it's like, you know, their, their boys are just like attached to them. Like, Hey, you want to go play catch? Will you throw me baseballs? All this stuff. It's like a nonstop request. And with our girls, 
it's always like, well, I'll do it if my friends are there. They always want to be part, part of like that herd mentality. It would be shocking for me to get my daughters to like, you know, go outside, just play catch or do flips in the yard or whatever it is. But if their friends are there, it's a, it's an absolute immediate. Yes. The first question is who's going to be there. Did you see that with yours or was your, was your daughter a little bit more maybe intrinsically motivated to want to attack that? She was more isolated. And part of it was because she didn't fit in mm -hmm. because she really wanted to be a good athlete. I can remember her telling me when she was 13 or 14 that, you know, the, well, the girls, on my team are fine, but they're, they're like social hockey players. Yeah. They, don't, they don't really want to be good at this. She was, mm -hmm. So she had probably spent too much time with me, truly too much time in the locker room. The the best thing that happened, you go back to um, Coyle's uh, book and he talks about ignition. And I took Michaela when she was 12. I took her to national camp with our Olympic hopeful team. And it was literally like a member of a lost tribe suddenly mm -hmm. realizing that she had found her people because yeah. she's there with these girls that are going to, what will then be, I guess, the 2010 Olympic team and uh and she's like looking around like thinking dad there's other big girls around here that really like hockey <laughs> you know and yeah. and so she was you know part of it is finding their elements and but my son was much like that you know I used to take to the gym I, I I'm up to now I have a group of 10 kids that I train regularly I've trained them for four years and you know the group kind of kept growing and kept growing because it was always you know, can this kid come? Can that? Kid? I was like, anybody yeah. can. Anybody who wants to come can come as long as they're committed. If they want to get yeah. better, they can come. Mm -hmm. If again, and that was more my like, you know, if they're just along for the ride, yeah. uh, we don't need them. You know, they can come visit someday. And mm -hmm. but you know, if they and he's got all ten kids are playing in college. That's awesome. At some level, you know, a couple Division One kids, a couple Division Two kids, a bunch of Division Three kids. You know, there's a kid playing football. There's a couple of kids. There's four or five playing lacrosse. As uh, you know. And it was just because we had our little gang that went to the gym. And I realized that in some ways for me, you know, some people be like, oh, you're training all these kids for free. Cause I just take them and bring them with me. I'm not mm -hmm. charging their parents. I just yeah. want, I want to have a bunch of kids around mm -hmm. who are supporting what my kid wants to do mm -hmm. or what I, not even like what I want my kids to do. I'll put, mm -hmm. I'll put it more yeah. diff differently, but I facilitated that in the mm -hmm. sense that I drive, whatever it was, I'd, you know, I'd take them to get something to eat afterwards on certain days, like whatever. I really wanted to facilitate this process of that. Hey, we're going to get two days a week in the gym. Yeah. And a lot of the kids started to, but to buy in and realize, Hey, this actually works. I'm, you know, I'm getting stronger. This is, this is being productive. Uh, and I did that to some degree with my daughter, but it, with her, it was more, I'd let her work out with the older girls. I'd let her work yeah. out with the girls that were in college or the girls that were trying to play in the Olympics or whatever it was. Yeah. She just wanted, she like, she wanted to see those people that she wanted to be. Yeah. And that's where, like I said, even with yours with twins, like one of the things you realize in parenting is that it is a very inexact science and there's certainly a genetic component to it, but it's an odd genetic component in the sense that there are things, you know, my daughter is much more like me. My son is much more like my wife. Like you look at it and think, how does this whole thing actually <laughs> work when yeah. you're putting it together? You know, you've got twins, like yeah. I said. And they don't, they have extremely yeah, different like, personalities. Yeah. And I, I hear that all the time from people in terms of, I have one friend whose daughter is playing college lacrosse and the twin has no interest, never did. And it's, who knows? But I think the biggest thing is to be a facilitator of them and their friends, to be mm -hmm. able to put them in a situation where, they're doing what you want them to do. Yeah. You're setting the guardrails a little bit. Yep. But you're also saying, hey, the more the merrier. The more, you know, if people want to come and want to do it, then that's great. Well done. And that has worked for us. And it's not without its friction. I mean, I, I think my son and I probably argued more than my daughter and I argued about about being on time and about mm -hmm. doing what you need to do. And But again, 16, 17-year-old boys are different than 16, 17-year-old girls. <laughs> Uh, shifting gears a little bit on the training side of things. Um, you know, part of that two times a week for, you know, for an extended period of time is understanding in season versus off season training. And you've obviously had experience with, you know, world series rosters. You've had experience with national championship hockey teams, which are, you know, very different metabolic demands, big picture. When we talk about, you know, in season versus off season, what separates the good from the bad? And what are the most common mistakes you see on the in season training side of things? Cause I remember 
early in my career, somebody saying that what really differentiated you above all else is that you were an outstanding in-season strength coach. You, you understood how to manipulate that aspect of the year better than anybody else. It's consistency. That's number one. I don't think any, that's probably the, the key in the off season too, but in season you have to get, you have to keep your guys doing it. So that's what you said, manipulating, you know, you have to figure out, okay. And that's the push versus pull thing in season. You're always pulling. Mm -hmm. I wrote an article one time, you know, about, uh, you know, forget what I called it, but basically I said that strength coaches and dentists had a lot in common in terms of, mm -hmm. I called it the dentist and the ice cream man. I said, in the off season, you're the ice cream man. You know, everybody wants to see, everybody's like, Oh, Mike, you know, I can't wait. And then in season, it's like going to the dentist guys, guys come in like, Oh, come on. You know, <laughs> we're really going to do this. And you're like, yep, we're going to do this. We're just going to keep doing this because truthfully, I think people put way more uh, weight into the science part of it and way too little weight into the psychological part of it. Yeah. It's not rocket science at all. I can remember getting Andrew Miller to just, Andrew, I just need you to keep lifting during the year. You don't have to lift heavy and literally thinking like, oh, we did six SLDLs with the 20 kilo kettlebell. You know, I'm, I'm going to sneak the 22 in there this time. You know, we'll go 20, 22, 20, you know, and just kind of gradually progressively resisting him a little bit during the season, but never no shock to the system, no soreness. Cause that's the thing I think you have to be careful of in season yeah. is that no one wants to be sore. As soon as somebody's sore, they're looking at you like, what happened? I'm not, I'm not amused with, with you right now because, and, and I used to always say to them, one, if you, if you're consistent, you won't be sore. Yep. And if I do my job right, you won't be sore. So if I can sort of massage the variables very gradually during the course of the season and you don't miss any workouts, you should never have a day where you come in and think, my God, I can't move because yep. of that workout that we did. We just, and again, I'm a decidedly low volume person. I probably in season, we probably put as much time into warming up as we do working out. And I think guys, you know, guys liked that guys. Um, and if you can make them think that it's individual, even when it's not, because, <laughs> yeah, you know, I think that's the essence of programming. It's going to be, you know, 80, 20 or 90, 10, mm -hmm. the same. But if you can start to put some things in there that they think are specific to them, Hey, I need you to do this because of this, but I also need you to do this, 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 and this because this is what everybody's doing. Yeah. They can do it, but it's, it's way more, I think particularly at the, the higher levels, being a good psychologist is yeah. being, is much better than being a good strength coach. Truthfully. I love that. It's a valid point. Um, and, and, you know, maybe major league baseball is the best example because it is just, it's an absurdly long season, right? It's, you know, 162 game season, you throw spring training in, you throw playoffs in, you could have, you know, 200 games in 230 days. In your experience there, did, what did you find was the lowest hanging fruit for really, uh, you know, affecting favorable change in, in that demographic? Same. Well, I would say that number one, relationship. Mm -hmm. And I've told this story numerous times on numerous podcasts, but I read the media guide every morning that first year that I was there in terms of I wanted information about these guys. I wanted to be able to have conversations about about their wife, about their kids, about where they went to college, about who their college strength coach was, whatever it was, I wanted to, I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to play six degrees of separation with you. And I'm going to find some commonality, whether it's the fact that, oh, we both have a boy and a girl or that, mm -hmm. oh, you went to university of Texas, you know, with so-and-so your strength yeah. coach, that kind of thing. Because if you could develop some conversational relationship with guys, it was very, very easy to get them to do what you wanted to do. They would, because baseball guys, they get a really bad rep. They're, I would say, 90% really good guys. They're not, everybody always kind of paints them as these sort of arrogant prima donnas. And I'm like, I did not have that experience. I can remember even predating you, but at the Yankees, because then in Fenway, there was only one weight room at that time. So the, the visiting team would come over, say at four, and use our weight room. And I can remember uh, A-Rod and Jeter coming over asking if they could use the weight room, introducing themselves. Hi, I'm Alex. I'm Derek. And I was kind of like, obviously, you know, like, I know, like I know who you are, but they introduced themselves by their first name. They shook my hand when they were done. They said, thank you. And they left, they put all their weights back. Yeah. I look at that and think that's not, those aren't arrogant guys. Those are guys that were 
it, particularly for who they were relative to the game, they could have been. And there were some few I could name a couple. I could have give you a couple other names that were not so good, but at the same time. And Ortiz was like that. Ortiz was always nice. Like he was like freaking Santa Claus, you know, just this happy big guy, always smiling, you know, never have like a never have a bad day kind of guy, like to work out. Uh, so I think it was relationship and consistency. And if you can develop the relationship, then you can get the consistency. And that particularly when you're looking, like I said, over that long season, because You've been through it. I can remember, guys. I'm going to work out four days a week all through spring training. That lasts maybe two weeks at the most. The seven and then they <laughs> you and say, hey, let's go to three. Let's like, Can we switch it over? Can we write up a three-day program? Absolutely. I got three-day programs already yeah. for you. Another week later, I'm going to go to my in-season one, my, you know, my every fourth day or whatever. And yeah. I'm like, perfect. Whatever works for you. But I was very rarely argumentative. Mm-hmm. I would coerce more than anything I went – because initially we we had a big injury problem when I first got there, and I went to, I knew Pedroia from before from Exos Athletes Performance Days, just at least kind of conversationally, and I didn't know Ortiz before, but he was again very easy guy to talk to, not not at all standoffish, but they wouldn't warm up. They were guys. They went right to the cage. They walked in. They put their shit on. They went to the cage. They started swinging, and I did not want people going in the cage and started swinging. And I was adamant about. I need everybody to warm up. We're having a huge, you know, that time yeah. we're having a huge problem with oblique strains and, blah, you know, lat strains and all this stuff. And I said, a big part of it is that you guys just walk in here, have a cup of coffee and go and start hacking away at the <laughs> baseballs. Mm-hmm. And I said, I need you guys. And they were like, well, I don't really like to do it. I said, I don't, I don't care that you don't like to do it. You guys are my leaders. If everyone else sees you stop by the weight room and spend a couple minutes that I can then stop them and say, hey, everybody's doing it. Yeah. Petey's doing it. David's doing it. You got to do it. And they both looked at me. They were like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I'll do that. And Ortiz would create one of those Swiss wings. Remember the Swiss wing vibration yeah. of the cylinders, which I really liked. I don't know what ever happened to him. I always thought that was a pretty cool little gadget. Yeah. But he just come in and sit on the Swiss wing, you know, warm up his groin, warm up his hips, whatever. But I was like, David, as long as you stop on your way and you do something that looks like warm up, I can now That's stop nice. every single guy that goes by the door and say, mm-hmm. Hey, we're warm. We're not going in the cage. And I would go in the cage and get guys out and bring them back. Mm-hmm. And uh, part of it, I think too, is that sometimes if you're just dumb enough to realize that, that you don't care, then mm-hmm. the guys kind of look and think, I can't believe you just walked in the cage and told me to get out. Mm-hmm. But I would walk in the cage and be like, Hey, what did I you know, I need five minutes. Come in here and yeah. freaking spend five minutes on the foam roller, do a couple mobility drills for me so we don't, you know, so you don't end up on the DL like whoever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It worked. It's, I mean, we went from a very unhealthy team to a very healthy team. It's 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 crazy to say. Um, I mean, you're familiar with the FIFA eleven. Like I think we would we both oh, yeah. probably agree. It's it's pretty rudimentary. There's nothing really remarkable in it. It's to be honest, not even that much stretching. It's like running, change of direction, a little bit of kind of like pseudo strength conditioning. And then they, they do some high speed running. And there was a, a meta-analysis I talk about a lot, 30% reduction with in, in soccer injuries over, I mean, they did studies of like, I think there was six separate studies with over 6,000 players, literally just warming up and you get a 30% reduction. But the problem That's- is baseball is such a long season it, and there's so much uh, stop and go. Like you come in, maybe you do some stuff early in the day, then you eat a meal, you chill. Then there's, you know, four o'clock BP or playing catch in the outfield. Then there's chilling. And then you're throwing the seventh inning of a game that you really have to be willing to not just warm up once, but do it repeatedly throughout the day. It's, it's just so long, uh, long season and a long day. Yeah. But the FIFA 11 is the classic. Yeah. Something is better than nothing thing. Yeah. Because you look at that and think it's, it's not particularly impactful. It's nothing that yeah. you'd look at and say, wow. Yeah. That's really high value stuff. Yeah but it just shows the value warming up versus not warming up yep. organized warm up versus unorganized warm up. Yep. Organized warm up was 30% better. It's like the, all the ACL studies, any intervention lowers ACL risk <laughs> standing on one foot, yep. 30 seconds on each side, lower ACL risk than people who didn't stand on one foot it's because incredible. something is better than nothing. And that's, yep. as I said, I just went for, as I always do. I mean, it's my kind of MO. I went for the basic stuff. You know, we did basic lifts. We didn't do anything particularly fancy. I didn't. The good thing is I had had the advantage of seeing and actually Yankees predating both you and I. So it would have been pre 2004. 
they had a guy come in who was going to, you know, revolutionize their strength and conditioning. And he took all the machines out and, and it was literally, I don't think he made it through spring training before they had to fire him because the players were so pissed. <laughs> and there was a guy in Seattle did the exact same thing, yeah. got fired before spring training was over. So I went in more and thought, okay, I'm not going to go in here. I'm not going to try to, you know, heavily rock the boat or reinvent the wheel or do any of that stuff. I'm just going to go in and I'm going to take my time and I'm going to get to the point where I can converse with these guys and, and get them to, you know, think, right. How many times have you heard this stuff? You know, no like trust, right. Yeah. You know, in business people, they want to yeah. do business with people they know they want to do business with people they like, they want to do business with people they trust. That's the essence of every business presentation you ever hear. That's also strength and conditioning, right? I want to know you. I want to like you. I want to trust you. If I know you and I don't like you, then we've got a problem. Yeah. If I don't like you, I probably don't trust you. And you know, we have, I always said, I, I did the podcast not too long ago with somebody. And I said, you realize in pro sports, you can't be a hard on pro sports. Like if you go into pro sports and, and try to tell, now that's where some of these, because again, nice guys, but they all have egos, right? And you know, they're probably the bigger the paycheck, the bigger the ego. You go in and start telling guys what they're going to do. They're going to not do it mm -hmm. just to spite you. They're going to be like, yeah, you know, I, I've had guys look and be like, you know, wasn't me, but I've had a guy look at me one time, but he was talking about somebody else and he said, Hey, hey I'll be here long after he's gone. He said, and I make way more money. <laughs> yeah. He's like, so Maybe I'm not you know worried. Versus what you can implement. I think you've dropped that line in the past. Being able to reconcile yeah. the two things. Um, shifting gears a little bit, you've, uh, you've got a new book out. It was actually, it was 2023, but, um, it's the second edition of your popular designing strength and training programs and facilities. I'm, I'm curious what led you, cause the original one was, was quite a while back. What led you to wanting to, uh, to do a sequel? Um, what really led me to want to do it was reading, <laughs> you, know, you have done that. I'm sure you've read some yeah. of your old stuff. I thought, yeah. Ooh, not, I, yeah. Interesting when I read, so I redid functional training for sports at the behest of human kinetics mm -hmm. and it was really interesting so um oh i can't i can't think of the editor's name now oh my god which is terrible he's a great guy uh but he had said to me hey i really think you should redo this book mm -hmm. and i was like it's fine like what would i he and he said oh i just said do me a favor reread it spend an hour rereading it if you don't think it needs to be redone end of conversation <laughs> i sat down with the book for an hour and I immediately emailed him back and I was like, this is sh who wrote this. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt that way as much as I liked designing strength training programs at facilities, I felt like, wow, there's so much more that I can add mm -hmm. to this book. So I did the same thing. I just went back and did the exact same thing. I, you know, I started at the beginning and I effectively rewrote every chapter based mm -hmm. on where I am now. And cause that book, and you know, you've written yeah. a ton, but Every article, every book, whatever, is a snapshot of where you were at that point yeah. in time. And again, you might go back and look at some of the stuff that you wrote, you know, early in your career, 2004, 2005, and think, wow, I don't, I don't even believe that anymore. <laughs> yeah. Right. I wouldn't, if someone asked me about that information, I wouldn't direct them to my own article. <laughs> and that was kind of where I was because I, you know, we were talking about, I was talking about things in that book that we just flat out don't do. Yeah. And and I would tell people now not to do so. And so now I feel like, okay, I've got most of my information, at least print information is pretty current, which yeah. is good. I thought it was, what I loved is like when you can, uh, you and I both know, I mean, I'll, I'll spend whatever on a seminar. If I can walk away from that seminar, knowing it made a meaningful change and something I can deliver more value to, you know, clients and my staff and all that stuff, you know, you read this book and it's, it's an investment. It's not an expense. You, you buy it, you read it. And you actually implement the advice, you're going to save money. You're not going to buy silly equipment. You're not going to waste on, you know, uh, poor initiatives for your facility. You're not going to hire the wrong staff. You're going to have a, a better feel for how to carry yourself in this industry. What are some of the most important lessons you think that you conveyed in this book? What would you highlight if someone was, you know, taking a 30,000 foot view on it? I mean, the big one, it was, I think, because, it you know, initially it started out as a facility design book, but that ended up really only being the first chapter. But I think that first chapter has huge, if someone... If you have a facility, it's really, like you said, really valuable information because it's all common sense stuff yeah. that you might not think about yeah. 
from how close do your racks go? How far are the bar ends from each other? I mean, every yeah. every kind of little variable, even you'd save a lot of money. I, there's a section there, don't buy 35 pound plates. And people are like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, no one puts a pin on the rack for a 35 pound plate. <laughs> so 35 pound plates just end up screwing up your rack. And you can always make a 35 with a 25 and a 10. Like you don't need, you know, once you've got your 45s on, no one cares. No one really gets that wrapped up in, oh, 295 should have a 35 instead of a 25 and a 10. That doesn't bother anybody as much as it would if you said, oh, 225, I'm going to put 25s and 210s on someone to be like, no, we can't do that. So there's just a lot yeah. of stuff like that. A lot of, I would say, um, gym wisdom accumulated yeah. over time. And there's a lot of that in the programming parts in terms of, okay, there's the explanations for, you know, why are we sprinting? Why are we choosing the exercises that we're choosing? And again, I think for most people, for people who know me, it would be reinforcing. Yeah. For people who didn't know me, it would probably be really thought provoking because people mm -hmm. would read it and go, hmm. Because part of a big part of the, I think the problem that people have with me is that they don't understand what I'm trying to get accomplished. Yeah. They just dislike me based on my <laughs> stance, on a particular lift. Yeah. He doesn't like the back squat. So therefore, I don't like him. And you think, yeah, but if you understand, contextually understood what it is about back squatting that I don't yeah. like, you might realize that, Oh, I, I've, I might be coming to a similar conclusion here at some point yeah. relatively quickly. So. Or all that, that you agree on the other 98% of things that you do I, on a daily basis. That's like me. Like I always yeah. say like with, you know, people like I can remember people saying, you know, you and Dan John must not get along at all. And I'm like me and Dan John get along famously. We love yeah. each other. We have the best time. But he's still like a conventional barbell guy, you know. He's more of like a Bill Starr, you know, yeah. kind of big three guy, and I'm not. But I, but that doesn't, for any reason, make me think, oh, I don't like him. And that's where you get into a lot of the kind of disagree versus yeah. dislike. Everybody's not going to program exactly the way I do. Do I think they should? Yeah, of course I do. If because if I thought your programming was better than mine, I'd do yours. <laughs> Yours would be yeah. mine you know I mean? because that's all mine is. Mine is a conglomeration of stuff that I've gotten from other people. But you always feel like what you're doing at the moment is the best thing. Yeah. If you're not, you should be doing something else. Absolutely. Um, I mean, it's an awesome book for, for those who didn't get the name the first round. It's Designing Strength Training Programs and Facilities. All right, we always do a lightning round at the end. We've covered some really good stuff. And there's actually the first one probably piggybacks right on the last one. What are the two books that you've either recommended or gifted to up and coming coaches the most over the years? Uh, definitely How to Win Friends and Influence People, yeah. number one, without oh. question. That, I, I am constantly referring to that. The other one, as far as gifting to people, the second one might be goals by Brian Tracy, actually, because mm -hmm. I think a lot of times I'll have conversations with people who are kind of, I don't know what I want to do. And then I think, well, you should read goals by Brian Tracy and really start to hone in on what your goals are, because I yeah. can't tell you where you want to end up. But if you can, if you can tell me where you want to end up, then I can maybe help you to get there. I think that's more important than ever before. I, I think I've noticed, I don't know if you've seen that as well in your interactions with the, you know, 25 to 28 year old coaches. I, I think more people are waiting for us to tell them what they should be just because they look and they see all the shiny objects and different people doing different things on social media. They, they really struggle finding their own path. You don't need to have a five-year plan. Like sometimes let's start on the one-year plan and then go from there. Yeah. Like that, and that's kind of what Tracy says. Like initially it's like, have you have a goal? I mean, something like if you say to me, this is okay. I want this. You know, if someone says the goal is money, then I'm like, okay, maybe you should get out of this field because more than likely, you know, it's going to take you, might take you 20 years to get to a position where you make a lot of money. Yeah. But um, if someone says, hey, it's pro sports, then I'm like, okay, then maybe Mike Boyle strength and conditioning isn't where you want to stay for 10 years because that's not going to get you to pro sports. So you've got to know what the goal is. And, yeah. and that book, it, it's been... It's kind of stood the test of time. That's awesome. Um, I know we, we've both spoken on the Perform Better Tour, uh, me since 2007, and you were on it even before that, and probably the best value in the industry. Um, so, I, you know, big shout out to Chris Porter for always doing an amazing job and his team there. But the follow-up question as that is, who are a few presenters that every young coach should try to experience in person that you think that were impactful for you or would be impactful for them? 
I think everybody, McGill is somebody that everybody yeah. should see. Definitely. I really believe that because again, it's one of those, you need to be in the room yeah. to understand the thought process. Yeah. So he's one guy that I think everybody should go see. I think I would love for everybody to go see Shirley Sarman only because yeah. I would love for everybody to go see this tiny little mm -hmm. 70 plus year old woman mm -hmm. who in my mind has kind of revolutionized the way that I thought. Mm -hmm. And I, I did that. I went, I think maybe it was when Art had her. I saw her somewhere. Art might have had her at uh, the old BSMPG yeah. once. And I went and I introduced myself to her and she was really funny. She said, she says, I know who you are. She said, people come to my seminars all the time because of you. She said, I have no idea why. She said, I don't understand it. I said, but they all say Mike Boyle said you should come. And I said, "I that's right. I tell people all the time because, I mean, again, brilliant in a very empirically brilliant way, obviously huge subject matter expert too, but uh, a lot of experience when you start talking about yeah. you've been, you've been doing therapy for, or, you know, whatever, yeah. 50 years, you've been teaching it for 40. That makes, that stuff really makes a big difference. The, the kind of been there, done that credential is a big thing. I really like, Sue Falsoni is really good. I honestly think yeah. listen to Sue because Sue, Sue has a great skill set in terms of she's been she's a really good therapist in, in her own yeah. right, but she's also kind of been a glass ceiling breaker. Yeah. So she's someone that across three sports, really, you know. Yeah, across three right. sports yeah. and developed, you know, a huge reputation because again, really good relationship person combined with a really good skill set. I like Greg Rose. I always say I'll go That's listen great. to Greg Rose talk yeah. about anything. Yeah. I don't even care. You know, he could be talking about golf. It doesn't matter to me. I'm like, fine, I'll go listen about golf. <laughs> Whether golf, you know, baseball, whatever he's mm -hmm. currently interested in at the time, yeah. I'm thinking he's going to probably say something reasonably profound. Uh, I'm trying to think who else did that. I really think, hey, I'm always trying to get in their room, but those would be four big four good ones for sure. Nice. All right, last one. You've seen a lot of coaches come through your facility, um, intern staff members who've you know, won Stanley Cups and World Series and all that stuff. What are some of the key characteristics of some of those early 20s coaches who you've seen go on to be the most successful to great things? Uh, number one, again, personality. Yeah. And I, in terms of, I, I guess actually I'll say one personality, two work ethic, and the two go together, I think, in terms of mm -hmm. you need to have the type of personality that is not afraid of work. You're not uh, you're not one of these people who's looking to play an angle, who's going to, yeah. you know, how do, how do I get by, you know, how do I get to the pros kind of thing? They're just, yeah. what do I got to do? I, Cause I, and I can remember seeing that, you know, whether it was Potenza or Devin McConnell or so many of these guys, you kind of knew who the guys were pretty quickly. Like, Hey, these guys really, I mean, I can remember Devin McConnell came to watch workouts at BU and he, you know, emailed me and it, I'm a goalie at Fitchburg state. And I thought, oh, goalie Fitchburg State. And I always, I'm pretty much open door guy. People want to come in. Mm -hmm. Hey, come in, watch. He came in, he watched, and I'm looking at him. He's got a notebook and he's writing away. And I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, well, I'm, I'm kind of, I kind of appointed myself strength coach too. So I'm writing the off season workout or the preseason workout for our team. And I'm like, really? You've appointed yourself the strength coach? He's like, yeah, we don't have a strength coach at Fitchburg. So I'm the, I'm the de facto strength coach right now. So I'm just trying to figure all this stuff out. I talked to him for about five more minutes and I'm like, do you have a summer job yet? <laughs> but I knew, like, I was like, this kid, like, he gets it. And you can just see the people that get it. They show up, they're eager, they're, they have that whatever. There is yeah. that, uh, you know, the charisma. Yeah, where you same, think, same person every day. Yep. And, and they're not afraid of work. Like, Potenza yeah. used to drive from Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. Drive to Rhode Island, from Rhode Island to Woburn. Or winch uh, no, we were in Burlington then. Yeah. And never honestly, I didn't even know he was doing it. Yeah. It wasn't like every day I'd heard about all oh, the traffic or I'm driving. So you know what I mean? Like that kind of I didn't even know he did it. I found that out. I mean, 20 years later. It's like you were living at home. <laughs> That's he's like, yeah, you know, I'd sleep on so and so's couch, you know, sometimes if I didn't want to drive home. But basically I was still living in uh Providence. Brajesh Patel, Brajesh used to go back and work and his parents restaurant or catering yeah. business they did every weekend mm -hmm. and he would be the first guy six o'clock in the morning on yeah. monday morning Rajesh is in there setting up 
And again, same took me a while to figure out that he was going home every weekend and working for his parents. Yeah. Never, you know, wasn't, you know, he wasn't whining about, Oh God, you know, I worked, you know, I worked 20 hours this, you know, Friday between Saturday and Sunday or whatever it was, not a word. Boom. Just there early, ready to go. I mean, the, the guys that are always there, ready to go, you know, they're going to be okay. It's just a matter again, goal. Where do you want to be? Yeah. It was, and it was very, very easy with all of those people to help them get jobs because yeah. I knew when I recommended them, they were going to work. They were going to work. Yeah. yeah. And every one of them, the first time it really took some doing because I can remember, you know, Devin got a job at Stanford with just a bachelor's. He had just graduated from Pittsburgh. He had a bachelor's and Brandon Marcello hired him. And I was Brandon. I'm telling you, I get it. I know it's a, a little bit unconventional. Yeah. I know he's not, on, you know, he's not on paper what you're looking for. You're going to love him. And he did, you know, for Jeff, same thing when he couldn't be act, the guy at the AD at couldn't be act was a friend of mine. And I said, yeah, this guy, you know, he's not your classic strength coach. You're not going to look at him and think strength yeah. coach, but yeah. I'm telling you, he's going to be unbelievable. Same thing. National yeah. champion at NCA or uh, what is it? Strength coach of the year for the NSCA yeah. last year. Right. Yeah. So. But, but it's, I mean, the good thing, you know, when you feel that strongly about somebody, it's really easy to recommend them and to say to somebody, like, I always look at people and think, hey, it's like me. They they know me. They like me. They trust me. And I'm saying to them, trust me on this. Yeah. I always say to people, you'll call me at some point and say, wow, that was a really good idea. I'm yeah. glad I did. That's great stuff. Nice. Well, this was, uh, this is incredible. Uh, best place for folks to find you. Obviously, there's bodybyboyle.com is the facility strengthcoach.com is a lot of your awesome content you're super active across especially twitter but also instagram right twitter m boyle m boyle 1959 on twitter i really liked i like twitter better than instagram yeah. although instagram gets more views and more people i like the i think the quality of interaction on twitter yeah. particularly as a strength and conditioning professional is better mm -hmm. or worse depending on how you're <laughs> choosing that's who you're talking to right yeah <laughs> And then Michael underscore Boyle 1959 is Instagram. So that's terrific. Appreciate you taking the time. This was long overdue, but totally worth it. I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you very much. Say hi to all the wonderful women for me, will you? Will do. Thanks for, uh, for taking the time. All right. Thanks. Thanks so much for tuning in to the CSP Elite Baseball Development Podcast. We really appreciate you carving out some time in your schedule to listen, not just to this episode, but also to some of the episodes from our archives. If you enjoy what you heard, we'd love it if you'd share it with friends, colleagues, and teammates, as well as leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Thanks again for your time.